Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're so glad that you're with us on this day in Black History Month, on this Valentine's Day, in this midwinter deep freeze we're experiencing across our country. A time to be warmed by music, to be transported to the shore as we explore another geography of the heart a time to find a settled, focused space in our home, in our office, wherever it is that you are in this moment, as we create spiritual community with one another. Thank you for being with us here at SSUC, Southminster Steinhauer United Church, where we are spiritual seekers united in community. Wherever you are in time, whether time is empty for you or full, whether you are anxious or feeling serene, in whatever space you are in this time, we hope that the ways that we share this time with one another will help us build the muscle of persistence and hope and resilience. I'm joined in welcoming you today by Carolyn and Micah, our music makers today, by my teammate Chris and my life mate Dawn, and Noah and Dara are here with us helping to shrink the geography between us with the help of technology. Wherever it is that you are, let's each take a moment to acknowledge the land that we call home, the place where we live and make our lives, to honor the long history of indigenous peoples. For those of us in the SSUC communities of Edmonton and Saskatoon, we honor the Cree and Métis peoples of Treaty 6 territory who have lived and worked on this land for generations. As immigrants, as refugees, as indigenous peoples, may we find a shoreline to walk with one another in a more respectful and hopeful future on this storied land. As we settle into this time and place, I invite you to join me in a ritualized moment. As we create the space that we will inhabit in this time, a focused time. If you have a candle with you, I invite us now to light our candles with one another.
We're grateful to Natalie Bowes, who is sharing her at-home candle with us today. We welcome the light that greets us in this new day, light that has traveled long in deep time and space to meet our eyes. We welcome, too, the wisdom that comes from the light of diversity, from our histories and cultures, from our traditions, our rituals, our languages. As we each center on the flame that is before us, may we open to mystery. May we open to the fragile miracle of life. Like the wick of our candle in relationship with the wax, the fire of life burns in us in ways that continually transform us and in ways that consume us with the earth beneath us, the stars above us. We honor the light that is within us, within each of us, within all of us. The creatures of man, the swimmers of sea, the birds of the air, the green plants and trees, their all our siblings with equal share in earth as our home and duty to care. Our ancient atoms are take this time to focus our intentions, to bring our attention to the way in which we would live, true to our deepest and highest humanity. And so I invite us to offer these words with one another as we offer our prayer together this day. Honoring distance we nurture connection. Amid fears, we foster courage. Embracing restrictions, we seek to be creative. In the midst of limitations, we choose to seek what is life-giving. Though isolated, we are not alone. We commit to sustaining relationships we commit to caring for ourselves and each other. May we lean into the goodness and beauty of life. May we make peace with the shore where we walk between the tides of restlessness and serenity. May we share an outbreak of wholeness and hope. May it be so. Good morning. I want to share uh, with you uh, a story, a, a book today that um, is really quite amazing and creative. Uh, and it talks to us about meeting someone new, and also about um, connecting with those that are different than us. S meeting someone new can be scary. We're not sure what to talk about. We immediately think that we're so different that we won't like the same things, or 
maybe we can never get along because we're so different, and maybe we think that because we're different, that makes one better and one worse, and that maybe leads us to be scared. But today I want to introduce you to Charles and Irene. They are two characters in this amazing and unique book, and it's a book of poems. And the poems alternate between Charles writing them and Irene writing them. They're brave. They show us what it's like to be a courageous friend. So this isn't the whole story, but it's just a few pages in this book that's called Can I Touch Your Hair? It's poems of race, mistakes, and friendship by Irene Latham and Charles Waters. The Poem Project. When our teacher says pick a partner, my body freezes like a ship in ice. I want Patty Jean, but Madison has already looped arms with her. Within seconds, you never know what he's going to say. Charles is the only one left. How many poems, someone asks. About what? Do they have to be true? Mrs. Vandenberg holds up her hand. Write about anything. It's not black and white. But it is. Charles is black. And I'm white. Writing partner. Mrs. Vandenberg wants us to write poems. Finally, an easy project. Words fly off my pen onto the paper like writing is my superpower. The rest of the time, my words are a curse. I open my mouth and people run away. Now I'm stuck with Irene. She hardly says anything. Plus, she's white. Her stringy, dishwater blonde hair waves back and forth as she stutter steps toward me. My stomach bottoms out. Hello, I say. Hi, she says. I surprise myself by smiling at her. She smells like a mix of perfume and soap. We stare at our sneakers before I ask, so what do you want to write about? She shrugs. I say, how about our shoes? Our hair? Then we can write about school and church. She takes a deep breath. Okay. I match it. Let's start there. Hair. Now my hair is long and straight, a curtain I can hide behind. But once, when I was little, I begged for an afro. So Mama cut my hair short as a boy's and gave me a perm. I fluffed it with a big pick as it would... As, as big as it would go, until my brother laughed, called me a circus clown without the red nose. Strands. On a random Tuesday on the bus, Dennis asks me, can I touch your hair? He pats it before I can respond. It feels like a sponge, he says. My fists clench and my face gets hot. You need to learn to wait for an answer after asking permission, I tell him. And I pat his hair, hard. Oh, how about that? Your hair feels like a mop, I say. I keep my fists ready, but he turns away. Playground. After lunch, I skip past the swings and basketball court to the spot by the fence where the black girls play freeze dance. I watch for a few minutes, hoping Shonda will invite me to join them, instead of me having to ask, can I play? I smile when Shonda comes over, but she doesn't smile back. You got the whole rest of the playground, she says. Can't we at least have this corner? Fresh start. 
Some kids huddle together by the swings, gabbing about the football game, when I spot J.R. and Nicholas. They're the only two friends who came by last summer when I invited everyone to swim in our pool. When I walk over, J.R. says, Come on, man, stay away from us. Nicholas breaks in. Your mouth is like a race car that never stops to refuel. The group shakes with laughter. I can't believe my friends would play me dirty like that. My body crumples before I mope over to Irene, who's watching some girls play freeze dance. I plop down next to her. Want to work on our project? Quiet time. For the first time ever, I take a seat beside Charles. Patty Jean looks at me. Are you sure? I'm sure, I say. Patty Jean shrugs, takes off her backpack, sits on my other side. I tell Charles about a book I'm reading, and he doesn't interrupt me once. Hey, Charles, I say, thinking about how much I like being sandwiched between two friends. Show Patty Jean what Nikki Grimes wrote inside your book, and he does. Blooming flower. I'm sitting next to Irene in class, and everyone is working on the poetry project. It's as quiet as a rock, except for the constant shushing being sent in our direction. Classmates are staring, giving us the evil eye. It's not helping, shutting up is not an option, until Mr. Mrs. Vandenberg walks over and says, Irene, I never thought I'd ever say this to you but you need to be quiet. These are just a few of the poems in Charles and Irene's poetry project that share about how they meet, how they get along, how they work together, how they become friends. If only we can do the same, to make our way through the hurt the challenge of race, the challenge of our perceptions and misperceptions, and work toward friendship, work toward partnership. It's the wonder of Charles and Irene.
Good morning, everyone. I want to share with you a poem this morning that has helped me navigate through difficult challenges in life, and I hope it's meaningful to you as well. It's by none other than the amazing Mary Oliver, and it's found in her book, Red Bird. The title is Swimming One Day in August. It is time now, I said, for the deepening and quieting of the spirit among the flux of happenings. Something had pestered me so much, I thought my heart would break. I mean the mechanical part. I went down to the sea in the afternoon, which held me until I grew easy. About tomorrow, who knows anything except that it will be time again for the deepening and quieting of the spirit. In these words of this amazing poet, may we find wisdom for our living. Ron Atkinson writes these words from a time when he was living on Quadra Island from his work, A Fire in the Rain. I wonder how much the geography of a place shapes the spirit of a people. Do prairie people know a boundlessness that mountain people or valley people cannot understand? At a resort in the Rockies, I met guests from the prairies who broke down and cried from the claustrophobia they felt from the encircling mountains. Here, 
We live not only amid the dense, dark mystery of the, central, the, of the coastal rainforest, but also surrounded by the shores of a small island overlooking the inside passage. We cannot look out far to any open sea. Steep mountains on the other shore bring the horizon closer. For us, the edge is always near, and this familiar place is inescapably bounded and defined for us. There are those who find such narrow dimensions too confining. The very immediacy and proportion of things threatens them. The rising mountains, the standing firs, and the constant motion of tides oppress them. Not everyone shares the temperament to welcome and recognize at every turn the immediacy of things and persons in such a small and bounded world. There is, after all, a chemistry in us that is found in the farthest star. Our minds and imaginations are tuned to cosmic space. There appears to be no limit to the desires and dreams that kindle those experiments that can outleap the past. The vastness of a broad plain or an open sea is an image of that consciousness coming into the communal mind of creation. Nevertheless, the marginal moment must also come to every living creature. There's a will towards an edge around us. The very roundness of the globe turns us towards each other and to the life that clings to our planet. The earth herself is but an island in a galactic sea, a very small, delicately beautiful island, the only one of its kind and perhaps the only one with anything like the life we know. That some humans have been privileged to view this from space gives us a refinement to our understanding of an earth island consciousness. To live on an island demands that we come to live life sacramentally by coming to know everything intimately and coming to treasure all that is well known. To live on an island invites us to affirm the lovely reciprocity between bounds and bonds. It means living at the edge and being glad of it. It means yielding finally to the ultimate edge of all. In the words of this writer, May we find wisdom for our living. There's something very special for me about the place where water meets land. As a child, universalizing my experience of growing up in northern New Brunswick, I thought that every child spent their summer afternoons at the shore. I come from a place where they're very fond of saying, there is no shore like the North Shore, that's for sure. I have a t-shirt that says that, so it must be true. In my early years, the banks of the Restigush River and the shores of the Bay of Shalor were places of rich play for me, places of imagination, places to skip stones, to build communities made out of sand that would come and go with the tide to discover stones and shells and driftwood of unique shapes, each with their own stories to tell. It was a place where I would imagine life as a grown-up and dream about the world on the opposite shore. As a young adult, the eastern shore of Nova Scotia, especially St. Margaret's Bay, 
was the place where I took refuge from academia as a student at Dalhousie in Halifax. It's the place where I would experience a different kind of elemental meeting place from the gentle tidal beaches of my childhood. Here, in St. Margaret's Bay, Peggy's Cove as we know it, water and land meet abruptly at expansive solid rock. There are no wide pebbly places between the ocean and the land. There's the immensity of sound, the wildness of waves, the slow, imperceptible change of water shaping that ancient rock. And just before I became a Westerner, I experienced island life, living for a time in Prince Edward Island. A short drive in any direction from my home there took me to places where water meets land. Somehow, as I walked the shores of that island, I thought that any problem could be washed away in that space where water and land meet, like a seam in a garment, a place where they change one another. Whenever something pestered me, whenever something troubled me, like the poet, I went down to the sea to settle my spirit. The landscape of the shore is primal for me. It's always been the place where I've sought comfort, where I've sought clarity, where I've found refuge in my life again and again. Even living in this landlocked province of Alberta, I have returned again and again to the places where water and land meet in search of the wisdom of that particular landscape. When I sit at my desk in our home office, I'm facing two images of this primal place. These two prints have been in my life a long time, and they have sometimes been my windows. The Big Sur coastline print was a gift to me when I graduated from law and I began my first opportunity to practice law in an interior space of a high-rise building downtown. No windows. This was my window. And the image of the Four Views of Vancouver by Roy Henry Vickers was a print I purchased when I first opened my own legal practice as a reminder of the place that grounded me that centered me. Maybe because I've been shaped by shorelines all my life, I've been drawn to the stories in our tradition from the Galilean shores where pragmatic, hardworking peasants began a movement of radical resistance and held a vision of a more equitable social arrangement that has persisted all these centuries later. It is that landscape that gives us many of the stories we know best about Jesus of Nazareth. Over and over again, the shoreline along the Sea of the Galilee is the setting for so much of the teachings of Jesus, for his recruiting, so many of the healing stories that have been passed down to us about him. As an adult, he first appears in the world of our stories along the banks of the Jordan River. And then we find him next on the shores and in the villages that border the Galilee. Only occasionally do we find him teaching in the synagogue and only rarely do we find him in the temple in Jerusalem. Mostly, the story places him in his unconventional classroom in the villages around the Sea of Galilee, on the shore of that 
body of water that is really a lake, or in a boat on the lake itself. It's the landscape in which the most ordinary individuals left their livelihoods and their families for an itinerant life with a compelling teacher, the son of a carpenter. Because something happened for them in that place where water meets land. Something changed their dreams, their hopes, their ambitions. Something came of that chance meeting with a stranger on a shore. And for the fishers among them, the deep place was no longer offshore in the middle of that lake. But the deep place became the thick of their relationships with their teacher and with each other. The shore was a meeting place that changed their lives, reshaped their priorities, changed their vocations, altered their perceptions, and affected their destiny. In the years that followed, Jesus and his friends became a community that were shaped and reshaped by who they were together. A community that came together and changed one another in ways that they would never have imagined. The place where land and water meet is a landscape defined by difference. It's created by the effect that two different elements have on each other at the shore. Land is forever changed and rearranged by the endless conversation it has with the water that meets it. And the waters are forever changed by the land that meets it, that changes its chemistry and its composition The shore is the landscape that's created by the deep communion of two distinctly different elements, a sometimes quiet and gentle communion, a sometimes wild and forceful communion, but always a landscape where each element is changed by the other. One of the deep spiritual needs of our time is our genuine human need to meet one another on a shoreline, to meet one another the way land and water meet each other. Two unique elements forged in the same stars to meet each other with respect and curiosity. For many of us, one of the greatest laments of our tragic history, the inheritance of our ancestors, coming to these shores lacking the curiosity and the respect to be shaped and influenced and changed by those long in this land. And then the horrific legacy of enslaving the labor of others, bringing them to these shores against their will, as though their lives didn't matter. Giving us both the evils of racism, colonialism, slavery. We continue to be impoverished as a people by the systemic racism that keeps us from being shaped and enriched by one another. In the endless communion of water and land, the chemistry of water is forever being altered by the land. And the contour of the land is forever being shaped by the water. These ancestors of our Jewish Christian household who found one another on the shores of the Galilee and changed each other 
in the intensity of their life together, shaped an enduring legacy of a radical love that we have inherited in the essence of our story. I've pondered that we are visiting the wisdom of this particular geography on Valentine's Day. Also, on a day in which we are invited to participate in the Have a Heart campaign, the child and youth-led reconciliation campaign to help ensure that First Nations children get a fair chance at growing up safely at home, getting a good education, being healthy, and feeling proud of who they are. Each year, schools write letters and poems. Children in Ottawa and Gatineau and areas surrounding Parliament Hill in non-COVID times come together and stand together there for love and fairness. This year, there are still many ways to stand with our First Nations young people through an online campaign. Just search, have a heart. Click on the links from this week's messenger and explore what's possible. Whatever our relationship status, Valentine's Day is an invitation to remember those who have shaped us, parents, partners, children, friends, our communities, the land that raised us, teachers, mentors, authors, songwriters, composers, there have been so many shorelines in our lives, places where we have been deeply changed by the other, by one another. This is a time that many in our part of the world would be seeking the tropical shores of some warm place to escape winter. And this year, instead, we're invited to the shores of our own hearts, the meeting places where we are shaped and shaped by the life we share. Even in this pandemic time, or maybe especially in this pandemic time, it is a time to visit the intertidal places in our lives those places where we're shaped by the wash of our experience, by the tides of monotony and uncertainty. Because even now, a shore awaits us in our landlocked lives, probably where we least expect it. Those places of deeper meeting, where we're summoned beyond contact to communion. We might find it in a place of memory. We might find it in the eyes of a masked stranger. We might find it in a creature who needs our care. We might even find it right here in online community we create with each other in this very place where we shape and change one another just as surely as any wave rearranges the sand. So let's open to the shore that emerges for us today, whether it's in a phone call or a card or an opportunity to learn or in a moment when eyes meet eyes. May it be so for each of us in a variety of ways, wherever we find the place that waits to shape us.
want to share with you a few invitations this morning. Um, the first of which is our coffee and chat that's happening today in, uh, in just a few minutes at 11.15. Uh, log into uh, the Zoom link that you'll find uh, on the website on your screen or in your morning messenger and just come say hello. Say hi to those who, who join and, uh, and catch up with each other. Also an invitation uh, uh, next Tuesday evening, February 23rd, to the next session of the Tuesday Topics Winter Series hosted by SSUC Saskatoon. More information is available uh, in your messenger uh, or you can contact us to get information about that. I want to, uh, I want to share with you some greetings uh, from the West Hill community this, uh, this morning. I was with them uh, at bright and early at 8.30 uh, this morning as their guest speaker, and uh, their community um, is meeting on, they're having uh, non-gatherings on Zoom every Sunday, and they are thriving and uh, wanting to know that they uh, support and, and appreciate the connections with SSUC and, know, and see us as kind of their sister community and and it was, uh, it was beautiful to be with them for, uh, for their time together this morning, and they wish to send all their love and their connection uh, to this community. So, uh, greetings from all of them to all of you. I want to thank everyone for the way that uh, you continue to support this community. And if you uh, would like to make a donation, um, you can do so in multiple ways, sending an e-transfer, donating at our website, uh, mailing a check, uh, and, uh, or, or contacting the office to set up uh, automatic withdrawal by, by, uh, by the PAR system. And so, please, uh, ex our extended thanks to you for the many ways that we continue to support the work that we do, that that connects us, but also that connects us to those agencies and those uh, concerns that have us making a difference across our city, our country, and our world. Thank you very much. When we meet at the shore, we are bringing things together. We are making connections. We are seeing two things come together as one. It's a good symbol for the life of our heart 
the life of our love, the life of our compassion. And so as we wish you into this week, we do wish you the blessing of hope, of connection, and of all those things that the geography of our hearts inspire in us this week. Take your flame and transform it. Transform it into the love and the action that will come later today, later this week, whenever it inspires. Change this light into what it needs to be. And in so doing, we wish you the blessing of a good week. May you be safe and well, and until we see each other again and join together, we remain connected.